So um, thank you to the stayers who <laughs> stuck in for the day. Um, it's been, a, I, I think, a, a very kind of positive day. I, I've certainly really enjoyed um, the, the huge breadth of material that's come across um, during the course of the day. Um, and what I want to do in my talk is kind of abstract things a little bit. I'll be talking about putting an ear to the ocean, which was um, the work for which we got a research excellence award from the university last year. But um, I kind of wanted to draw a little bit on um, something I've been doing over the last three years, which is writing a book about cerebellum. Um, so <laughs> as the introduction said, I'm kind of split between marine science and center of brain research, and really interested in um, evolution of the brain. And kind of at my career stage, I would certainly recommend, and I think there's a, there's a huge um, <coughs> benefit in, in trying to do some sort of synthetic exercise. And it's taken me kind of three years to do that. Um, and I think that kind of synthesis, given the kind of the detail that we get into our research, and I guess one of the objectives of today is to pull together people from kind of different strands, uh, again, to look at those kind of synthetic issues and try and draw some of this um, stuff together. Uh, one of the experiences um, of going through the per writing this book about the cerebellum, and just to give you a little bit of background, the cerebellum's the bit on the back of your brain, 10% of the volume, but 80% of the nerve cells in your brain. Um, there's a diagram uh, kind of there of the, the cerebellar wiring and a kind of an engineering diagram of how we think it works, and I'm not going to go into any of that. Um, and what it's responsible for um, is a lot of motor control. Um, and apologies to, to Nick Rowe, I don't think he's kind of stayed, but I would have had a dancer here rather than um, a, uh, <coughs> a snowboarder um, if I'd kind of thought about that ahead of time. But what the cerebellum does in relation to, to motor control um, is it's part of the, the agency of how we do find motor control. And um, this whole issue of purpose and agency, uh, kind of what I'll run through the other research program, kind of what is the purpose of what we're doing and what, what's the agency, how do we make that happen, basically. And just to give you an idea of the importance of the cerebellum in agency, there's this idea of sense of agency. So one thing that the cerebellum does is for every movement you make, it's predicting what the sensory consequences of that movement are. And then the brain compares that prediction with what happens and where those, that comparison is good. That's what gives you your sense of agency of how you interact with the world. <coughs> so as I said, I'll, I'll just try and um, kind of run those ideas through um, this research program that we've been running now since the beginning early um, 2000s, and I've put a timeline across there um, just with the publications that um, are attributable to this program, and really th those come out of, and I've said there, there's a search, if you do a search on myself, Andrew Jeffs, and uh, Craig Radford, and then edit that down to uh, the acoustics stuff, those are the publications I'm representing there. And um, just in terms of purpose, um, the idea of kind of purpose is really the questions that we ask um, in the science that we're doing. And the question that kind of got us kicked into gear in this one was um, a student had a phone call out of the blue, Alona Stavutsky, she'd done a PhD at um, James Cook University working um, <coughs> on uh, Lizard Island. And what she'd found was that larval fish, and we're talking about things smaller than zebrafish, um, sort of 15 to 20 millimeters, knew where the island was that they were heading for, where they were going to settle, kilometers offshore. And at night, they'd be swimming towards the island. And the question was how? And given kind of my interest over many years in, in fish sensory systems, she'd kind of picked me out of the phone book and, and gave me a call. We talked about the various options. She wanted to, to put an application, try and get a postdoc in that area. And the kind of two um, areas that stood out to us as kind of possibilities was one, um, acoustics, could they actually hear the reef um, and orient towards it? And the other one was based on the idea that uh, around isolated islands, there are particular patterns of swell reflection and refraction. Um, and we know that it's in the repertoire, going back to Ann Salmon's talk this morning, um, of Polynesian navigators, that they use these cues to locate isolated island patches. And that seemed like a very Marsdenable idea. So we posed that question to, to Marsden, do fish larvae use the same cues as Polynesian navigators to make landfall? And we were successful um, in getting that grant. It always takes time. Uh, Alona had a, a real job um, by the time the money came through. So we recruited uh, another postdoc, a guy called Nick Tolomeri. And so the first publication that came out was um, in 2000, and that's the publication by Nick. Um, and 
and quite early into the project, he found that acoustics looked like a really promising cue. So it's fair to say that we kind of dropped the, um, the swell refraction, um, probably don't tell Marsden, um, and we kind of went with the, the alternate hypothesis, so that's still an unanswered question, so somebody could repropose that to Marsden and probably get it funded again. Um, <coughs> so, uh, and kind of what I wanted to represent across there is just the, the kind of idea of the way in which that question has changed over the last 15 years. So what Nick was able to show was the larvae are orienting towards replayed reef sound. And then the questions come up, so what's making the sound? What, what's distinctive about the reef? And is the sound different for different reefs? So Andrew Jeffs kind of joined the team. He still had a lot of the facilities um, from, from Niwa, brought a, a huge um, kind of boost to, to the project as well. Um, he put up another Marsden a couple of years down the track in terms of our marine ecosystem structured by sound. Again, that was funded, and as part of that, um, we were able to recruit um, Craig Radford to a PhD. Post-PhD, Craig um, managed to generate a, a Mars and Fast Start, and again, sort of taking the question the next um, step along. So um, if we know the, um, what sound is being made on the reefs, how far does that travel out to sea? And <coughs> so um, Craig um, addressed that question. And then his Rutherford was based around the idea, can we use passive acoustics to monitor ecosystems' health? So that's kind of the idea of the um, progression of um, questions. And I've just reflected um, back on Karl Popper's statement about science begins with a problem. Problems lead to guesses and conjectures. And if they're successful, this will lead um, to new problems. So that's the idea there. Then very briefly, just the idea of agency and, and kind of generalizing it from the agency I was talking about with respect to our own motor systems. The agency comes from the people and the facilities. So interdiscipline that we've heard about, a lot about today, Chris Tindall was our kind of physicist in the program and really kind of kept us honest there. In terms of the facilities, we've been extremely lucky to have the, um, the marine lab and the vessels and the staff there. John Atkins, who was uh, our um, electronics technician in the course of this project, has developed some of the best um, cost-effective hydrophones you can get anywhere in the world. So we've been extremely lucky. So just to, to finish up, um, going back to that idea of um, trying to be synthetic in the approach, um, if you look at the, um, the impact, and this is an impact with um, non-capitals, um, small letters, but these are some of the, um, the publications, the most cited publications out of this kind of body of work. Obviously, there's, there's a science one there with international collaborators. But two of the most cited um, publications that we've had there um, are kind of reviews that we've written, which have kind of really s established our kind of place in this field as it's developed. And then, gratifyingly, the kind of third most cited one there is, is Nick Ptolemy's kind of first paper, which kicked all of this off. So I just wanted to finish with this, this image talking about um, purpose and agency. And we haven't got time to go into the providence of this. This is a, a, a painting by Peter James Smith um, of the Antarctic. It's Mount Discovery looking from the, um, the pressure ridges at Scott Base. And um, the tracks out through there were our daily commute out to, uh, to the fish hut where we're doing the work down there. And it wasn't part of the brief, but I just think this is um, a kind of really nice kind of visual um, metaphor, if you like, for the ideas of purpose and agency, Mount Discovery, and our commute to work on a daily basis. Thank you. Thank you.